From seashell ear thimbles to three seashells, dystopia nerds like a lot of things, but there's something they love above all else, and that is correcting people. This is Um Actually. And a very special end of the world Um Actually we have for you today, uh, talking about dystopias. Today's contestants are Eric Foss. Hi everybody, sorry I forgot my pirate eye patch. Kelly Nugent. Hi! What's up? And we have DC Pearson. And a fine apocalypse to you, Mike. Fine apocalypse to you. A very appropriate <laughs> episode this year. I've been thinking about this for a while already. Just like, oh, you know, like there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of dystopic fiction out there that people do yeah. like to to get their hands on. And then this year just turned out to be the most apocalyptic Armageddon-y end of the world year uh, that I certainly I've ever experienced. So. Figured, uh, if you're not sick of thinking about it already, let's think about it some more. Yeah, here's an end of the oh, world yeah, the, second, the second that like things became DEF CON 1, you were like, I can't wait for my dirty little dystopian yeah. episode. <laughs> it's perfect. It honestly felt like this was the wrong time to do it, because like everyone's already so, t like it's fun to think about dystopias when everything's going fine. And you're like, yep, yeah, that's a warning, you know, like let's, cat let's nip this in the bud. Let's catch this problem while we can before things get bad. But when things are actually bad and someone's like, hey, can you imagine if things got bad? It's like, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> I'm living it. <laughs> well, some of you have played before, Eric, you've not. Um, but the rules are very simple. Uh, and if you have never seen this be before, here's a quick rundown. Uh, I have here a stack of statements. These are incorrect statements about uh, pieces of dystopic fiction. Uh, it's up to you to find what's wrong with what I've just said, buzz in and correct me. There's only really two rules. One is that you must precede your corrections with the phrase, um, actually. Jeopardy style, if you don't say um, actually, I will not give you the point, even if you're correct. And that's sad. So please remember to say um, actually. Um, uh, and then you can interrupt me whenever you want. That's all there is to it. Let's make it happen. Here's our first statement. In the universe of The Hunger Games, the capital is responsible for creating a variety of genetically modified animals. These include mockingjays, tracker jackers, and wolf-like mutations designed to partly resemble previously killed tributes. Kelly, do you have an answer? Um, actually, the animal thing is uh, totally fake, and it's like they do like battle royale stuff. Uh, they do do battle royale stuff, but the capital does like does do uh, these sort of like weird. They're called mutations. They're these like kind of genetically modified animals that that uh, have a per, have, perform a variety of different. Uh, different uh, tasks, but usually dangerous or anti-whatever. Uh, Eric's buzzed in. What do you have? Um, actually, the Capitol did not create Mockingjays. They were a, uh, a naturally uh, bred mutation in the wild. That is correct. That's what we're looking what? for. Uh, <laughs> the the, the Capitol created Jabberjays, uh, which uh, survived in the wild longer than they thought. Uh, and then they bred with local mockingbirds and uh, created Mockingjays naturally in the wild, which is why in the stories they're a sort of symbol of resistance, uh, an unexpected consequence that, that turned back against the Capitol. They did not cover that in the first book, which is the one that I read. <laughs> now, did the, uh, the stupid name come up organically in the wild, too? Or is yeah, that... right? <laughs> and the names are always these, like, portman these, like, stupid portmanteaus. It's like, it's like, I don't know whether or not in the real world, if that happened, we would do the same thing. We'd just be like, it's a pig and a raccoon? It's a pigoon. Or if we would, like, actually come up with something better. <laughs> Mike, I was going to say, I would feel more inclined to agree with you that I don't think people would just mash the names together if literally everyone I know didn't have a golden duty. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, or a puggle. Right. Well, uh, that point went to Eric, and we'll move on to our next statement here. The 2013 movie The Purge takes place in a universe where America holds an annual 12-hour event in which all crime against anyone is legal, including murder, arson, and theft. And no emergency services are available until 7 a.m. Uh, Eric and DC have both buzzed in, but Eric was first. Um, actually, it's not 12 hours, it's 24 hours? It's 12 hours, it's over the course of a night, so no, that's, that's incorrect. Uh, DC, do you know? Um, actually, Eric, thank you for jumping on that grenade of the exact answer I was going to give and allowing me to guess, is it is the help at like a different time than 7 a.m.? Uh, no, that is that is when emergency services uh, return, the 7 a.m. Kelly has buzzed in. It's, uh, it's more... <laughs> It's more than once a year. 
<laughs> no, just like actually, Christmas. The I'm purge actually, comes, actually. but once a year. Uh, that <laughs> special time. Uh, it's purge. It's purge, Miss uh, Eric. Um, actually, it's not the entire United States that participates in this awesome day. That's an interesting question. I do believe it is, but I wonder if like Hawaii and Alaska are like, we don't need to do this, right? Come on, this <laughs> is Hawaii's not doing, doing it. Guam? Yeah, right. They're like, hey, guys, come on, you can do that purge thing over there. But like, are the territories doing it too? Like, is is, is Guam? Uh, participating in the purge um I, to the best of my knowledge no i don't think so the answer i was looking for is that uh, i said all crime against anyone is legal but there are, is in fact an exception there uh uh government officials are exempt from the purge uh you cannot oh, target a government are. official of course oh, they are uh because that's They're who too everyone busy wants at the french laundry <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a little, a little for the i mean it feels totally right because it's like well yeah that's who everyone would be the most angry at uh <laughs> yeah. and also if they're like hey we've got this idea where where you kill each other but not us mm, i love killing each other for you absolutely like yes for you. <laughs> yeah, it makes the the elections for the local school board super high stakes like right yes. i was thinking, <laughs> i was thinking oh that too God. just like the number of people who are like i'm thinking of running for office this year like i don't know maybe uh i don't know what comptroller does but i'll figure it out bunch of kids in creepy masks are coming at you with the best i'm an alderman, alderman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no points for that one but we'll move on to our next statement here the movie logan's run takes place in a society where people are killed once they're 30 years old those who try to avoid this pre-scheduled death are called runners. Logan 5 is a Sandman normally tasked with finding and killing runners who attempts a run of his own. He is aided in his escape by Jessica 6 and a cyborg named Box, who offers them fish, plankton, sea greens, and proteins from the sea. Uh, Kelly has buzzed in. Um, actually, it's 25 instead of 30. That's a good guess, because I, I actually think in the book it is not 30. I think in the book it, it's like, it is like 21 or 25, but in the movie it is 30. Um, actually he's not called the Sandman. Uh, he is a Sandman. He, he, he puts them to sleep. Um, actually the cyborg uh, doesn't, he offers them this, like sea cucumbers or something. I, I, I don't know, something, something, in, something with that plankton. I know you. <laughs> that plankton is fucked, whatever that is. I don't trust that plankton. Ow. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, that no. He does. Box does uh, offer uh, uh, fish, plankton, sea greens, and proteins from the sea. We'll go ahead and call it. This is a little pedantic, but what I was looking for is that um, uh, Box does not aid them. Uh, Box is in fact a little bit of an adversary. He tries to shoot them and freeze them and preserve them in a block of ice in a hall with thousands of other runners who have attempted to run before them. Uh, this despite the fact that he does offer them uh, fish, plankton, sea greens, and protein from the sea. Oh, wait, so so he like lures them with the fish and the proteins? Uh, have any of you seen Logan's Run? I have um, not. Okay. Um, I included this question because it is uh, an insane scene. Like, up to this point in the movie, everything's been like kind of tracking like a pretty, like what you would sort of expect from like a sci-fi action movie. And it's like one of the most surreal <laughs> scenes in a movie where they just like, they emerge to this cave of ice. There is this uh, cyborg with, with a, a design that is just like, it's like a human head on like a big old giant, like <laughs> almost like Dalek type body. And the he repeats the phrase, uh, fish, plankton, sea greens, and proteins from the sea, maybe 10 times in the in the scene, where it's just like, every any time they're like, where are we? What's going on? It's like, I will give you fish and plankton and sea greens and proteins from the sea. Like, you feel like you've been <laughs> dropped into a different movie for like five minutes. This was clearly something like, like, oh, they took it over from the book, but they didn't really fully fold it into the movie because like, there's so much left unexplained about it. You haven't seen like a robot up to this point. Like everything about it is brand new. It's like, oh, by the way, in this world, there's robots. There's an ocean nearby. You didn't know that. Um, he's offering you food for some reason. Sea greens and things that I was like, nothing that's ever been mentioned in the movie up to this point. And then after that, they never talk about it again in the rest of the movie. <laughs> they realized it was an AI hat on an AI hat on like yeah. a sailor hat, right? <laughs> but you did hit on, Mike, you did hit on a really important screenwriting rule that I find is so fundamental to storytelling. Whereas if you have Plankton in act three, I want to establish them in act one. <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. We day effects plankton here. I, I've I've read a lot of scripts, and every time I'm like, well, the script is pretty good, but I just I'm left wondering, is there plankton in this world? You never talk about plankton anywhere, and I just I think if I'm wondering it, the audience will be wondering. All the it. other executives are like, I think Mike is a merman. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, no points for that one, but this will bring us to our next fan submitted question. This comes to us from one of our viewers. Uh, this comes from at Maya the Inferno. So thank you, Maya the Inferno, for this question. Divergent by Veronica Roth is about a strict society in which people are separated into five factions, depending on their personalities. The book takes place within a post-apocalyptic Chicago, with all of the factions living within the walls of the city except one. Only the Dauntless, the Brave faction, live outside the walls in order to protect the rest of the city from danger. Uh, Kelly. Um, actually, it's not Chicago, it's Miami. <laughs> uh, no, it is It is Chicago. Uh, now I'm just imagining post-apocalyptic Miami. Um, <laughs> Um, actually, yes, it is post-apocalyptic Chicago, and none of the factions ever leave Chicago because they're too busy doing slow character-based improv. <laughs> <laughs> it's really grounded. It's just yeah, really, it's really grounded. Are you going to go check out the show tonight? It's like, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe. I've just been watching a lot of those shows lately, so. Uh, but, but yeah, but you know someone there? Okay, yeah, we'll give it a go. We'll give it a go. <laughs> um, actually, there is another farming class. That, whose name I don't know, who is also allowed to venture outside the city walls. The Settlers of Catan. <laughs> <laughs> it's not entirely accurate, but I think you're close enough that I'm going to allow it. Specifically, what I was looking okay. for is that the Dauntless faction does not actually live outside the city walls, uh, but there is a faction that does, and that is Amity, which is a farming class. Uh, oh, so right. the fact that you had that farming in there, it's not that they're an additional one, but it's like they are the ones outside the walls. Oh, um, but it does, okay. it does raise the question that, like, wait, why are they not the brave ones then? Why are the brave ones still the ones who are like, yep, we're brave. We're just going to let you, the farmers, take care of that. Let me know if you need anything. You know? There's so many examples of like those kinds of books that fit in that same pattern of like um, young adult fiction. It being so popular because it is just like, people you don't understand just trying to put you in a box, man. Mom and dad, don't tell me what to do. I'm so much more than you think I am. Yeah, yeah. and also just like like a lot of that mapping over like clicks and stuff. So you're just mm -hmm. like, can you believe? And then, and, you know, it's like wish fulfillment where you're like, oh my God, one of the brave guys likes me, but I'm a farmer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that point will go to Eric. Uh, well, we'll move on to our next statement here. This is actually our first shiny question of the game. Uh, we're going to play a game called Apocalypse When. Uh, so in just a moment, um, I'm going to show you uh, six different examples of dystopic fiction. And we're going to try to put them into chronological order, not from when they were re released, but from when the end of the world is uh, in these stories. It could be a specific mm -hmm. event that is referenced in the story. It could be like when the story is taking place. But it's like, when is this sort of like end of the world happening? Let's take a look at these titles. If you think you know the earliest apocalypse, buzz in and tell me which one happened first? Uh, DC's buzzed in first. Um, actually, I'm gonna go It Can't Happen Here by Sinclair Lewis. That is correct. That is in 1936 is when that uh, disaster happened. Uh, Eric. Kelly, very close behind. Um, actually, I believe the next one was Escape from New York. It is Escape from New York. That uh, end of the world is in 1997. Uh, everyone, everyone is buzzed in. Kelly is first this time. What is the next one here? Um, actually, Brave New World. Uh, that is incorrect. That is not the next one. Uh, the next one who's buzzed in is Eric. Um, actually, the next one is Demolition Man. It is Demolition Man. You want to venture a guess at what year the world ends in Demolition Man? I think it's like the late 90s, right? It's 2032. Oh, okay. Uh, that is Eric and DC and then Kelly behind. What's the next one here? Um, actually, the next one is Minority Report. It is Minority Report. That was in 2054. 2054 was the, the end, the apocalypse there. Only two more left, so this will be our last one, because obviously it would just be process of elimination after that. That is DC with Kelly just a half second behind. DC, what is next? Um, actually, I took my Soma today. I'm going Brave New World. That is actually incorrect. That is not the next one. But don't you like how much I wound it up just to be real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Kelly, th this makes it a little easy for you, but what do you have okay, here? Okay, Matrix is next. Matrix is next, which of course leaves only Brave New World is the last one. In case you're wondering, the apocalypse in Matrix occurs in the year 2190. 
99, and the uh, Apocalypse and Brave New World is 2540, or oh, I didn't know it was that far. Or 632 after Ford. Didn't Aldous Huxley know that people have to write clickbait articles where they're like, <laughs> actually, it's this year now. Did you know that? It's the day today. That it's like, yeah, it's going to take a long time until we get to that. <laughs> well, uh, Eric was able to identify three of those. Kelly won DC2. That means Eric will get the point for this shiny question. Which of these would you choose to live in if you had to choose one? Probably like Minority Report. I yeah. feel mm. like you're pretty much only in danger if you're like going to do a crime or if you're Tom Cruise. Or I guess if you're like one of the precogs, I guess it's not great for you because you get put in like a pod thing, but. That's true. The pod looks a little comfortable though, right? Like it's like a kind of like a spa day, you know, you get to just sort of like, like just float around for a little while. <laughs> well, we will go ahead. We'll move on to our next uh, statement here. Next statement. Judge Dredd is a street judge in Mega City One, a sprawling megalopolis that covers most of what we know as the Eastern United States and parts of Canada. First appearing in Judge Dredd comic books, the character has been adapted to film twice, played by Sylvester Stallone in 1995's Judge Dredd and Carl Urban in the 2012 movie Dredd. DC's buzzed in. Um, actually, I believe it didn't first appear in Judge Dredd comics. It appeared in a like British anthology comic called, I wanna say like, I think it's like 1999 AD or 2099 AD or something like that. And an outside chance it's actually just heavy metal. <laughs> You're yeah. close enough that I'm going to give you the point. Uh, it, that is what we're looking for. He doesn't first appear in his own comic book. Um, he appears in a British anthology uh, book that is called 2000 AD. Uh, so you're ah, very close to 1999 real. AD. Really uh, <laughs> if I didn't give you that point for being one year off, I would have been a fucking monster. Uh, <laughs> but do you guys remember the year... The year 2000 AD, LFO was on the charts with Summer Girls. All the cities were consolidated into giant dystopic <laughs> yeah. megacities. Yeah, I'll also mention here that judges also hear civil cases in each city block where they try compensation claims, libel, slander, divorce, alimony, and small claims matters, which uh, just like just made me think it's like, I really want to see like the Judge Judy version of Judge Dredd or like Judge Dredd, like IP lawyer. Like, wait, what, like, what, what are all these like small claims judge courts going on? Are they wearing like the full armor to like yeah. hear a case? <laughs> full like anonymous visor, like sidearm and just like, it's like, well, <laughs> he didn't pay me rent for about 30 days after he was supposed to pay rent. It's like, oh yeah, well, he didn't ever fix the radiator. Yeah. It's like, all right, everybody <laughs> shut up, shut up a second. You see his like heads up display is like reading a lease. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that point will go to DC. And this will move on to our next statement here. In the Matrix series, Thomas Anderson, AKA, Neo is the second coming of a powerful figure known as the One, who has the ability to manipulate the code of the Matrix itself, giving him a wide range of superhuman abilities, including telekinesis and flight. Eric is buzzed in. Um, actually, he is not the second coming. He is actually either the sixth or the seventh iteration of the Matrix. Uh, that is completely correct. He's not the second coming. He's the sixth coming of the wow. one, uh, which is explained in great boring detail by the architect <laughs> in the second movie. <laughs> I am constantly fascinated and annoyed by the lore of the Matrix, because I do think they created like a really interesting world. And then through the sequels and the Animatrix, they do like flesh it out a lot. But it is just like long scenes of being like the opening of like, I don't know, like a tabletop role playing session where it's like, all right, let me yeah. lay out the world for you. It's like, you couldn't yeah. have wrapped this up into something. Yeah, you know, everyone's favorite scene from the first Matrix when uh, Larry Fishburne was in a white space and just had a battery. <laughs> What if we just yeah. took away all the visual examples and just left them in that void? <laughs> it feels very like um, during every one of those scenes, it feels very like beginning of someone's like one woman show where they're like, I remember the first time that I had too much caffeine. And then they like put their jacket on a rack. Yes, Siri, the Matrix is so full of a lot of interesting characters. Why I remember over here, the Oracle. <laughs> it's like shifted into a shawl. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, bad point. Uh, we'll go to Eric. Here's our next Next statement. The game Deus Ex imagines an America descending into chaos in the face of a massive wealth gap and a widespread lethal pandemic that first manifests as coughing and flu-like symptoms. The disease known as the Grey Death can be cured by administering a substance called ambrosia, but it is in critically short supply. Uh, Kelly. Um, actually, it's not America. It's in 
England. That's a really good guess. Uh, it is. Uh, it is. The game takes place in America. I don't know how far the pandemic spreads. I assume the fact they call it a pandemic assumes it's a worldwide thing, um, but it okay. does take place in America. Um, actually, ambrosia does not cure the disease. It just treats symptoms and alleviates. That's correct. Symptoms. <gasps> that's that's oh, actually oh, correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it does. Uh, ambrosia does not is not a cure. It just it requires continual injections uh, in order for you to remain safe from the virus. Uh, so, which is part of why it's in short supply because you need to keep reinjecting this. It's not a one time cure. If you can imagine needing multiple injections of something in order to get treatment uh, from a worldwide wow. pandemic. Um, did any of you play Deus Ex? No. This isn't a correction of any kind. I just want to say it's really fucking good. All right. I'll play it. If you want to escape, if you want to escape from your world right now, <laughs> yeah. hop into the world of Deus Ex and you know, get a little moment for yourself. Enjoy some video games. Yeah. Don't think about the world as it is. What if you play it now? What if you turn Deus Ex on in 2020 and it's just like Donkey Kong Country or something like that? <laughs> yeah, it's like not that bad. Yes, it's like relativity where it's like when viewed from 2020. It's like, yeah, this doesn't seem that bad. This is kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. That point goes to Eric. This will bring us to our second shiny question of the game. This is a game that we're calling Brand Awareness. Dystopic fiction is full of big old uh, corporate, uh, giant giant mega corporations that are out to fuck your life. Um, and uh, this is a game to see if you can identify the logos of some of those ginormo corporations. Let's go ahead and take a look at that first brand logo. What property is this from? Uh, Eric has buzzed in very quickly with DC Close Behind. Eric. That is the Whalen yutani Corporation from the Alien franchise. That that is correct. That is from Alien. And doesn't that look like a company that would be repped by Paul Reiser? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to reach me, you got to call uh, my agent at, uh, at Wayland Utani. <laughs> if you go to IMDb Pro, you can find everything there. Mm, Kelly's buzzed in. That's from Bioshock? That is from Bioshock, yes. Uh, that is Ryan Industries from Bioshock. Has a very Randian look to it, so I was like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yes, for Probably sure. Uh, DC. Um, actually, Toy Story, that's the company that owns Pizza Planet. Uh, that's a good guess, but that's that's not what we're looking for, no. <laughs> I love how Toy Story's post-apocalyptic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're a fucking toy, Eric, if you're a toy, you yeah. saw Toy Story 3. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. Toy Story is actually like, it's like Rise of the Planet of the Apes. It's uh, it's telling the story of before toys take over the world. Yeah. And, like This is just like the events that led to like when they finally snap and are like, we can run this world better than the humans can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, actually, it is the um, energy conglomerate for Idiocracy. Uh, no, no, no. Good guess, but that is not this one. Um, actually, it's from Resident Evil. Uh, no, this is not Resident Evil. We'll say no one got this one. Uh, Octan is from the Lego movie. This is the, oh. uh, the, the mega corporation within the Lego world from the Lego movie. Let's take a look at the next one. DC. Um, actually, just because it looks like kind of from that world, is it from the movie Ex Machina? Uh, it is not. It is not. Um, actually, it's like an ironically named company from uh, Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> <laughs> an incredible guess. Uh, no, no, that's not what this is. It kind of looks like that Tom Cruise movie that I have not seen, even though I will see pretty much any Tom Cruise movie. Oblivion? It's not from Oblivion. No, no, no. But you see what I mean? I, I totally yeah, see what I, you mean. As soon as you said that Tom Cruise movie that it looked like I would have liked, but I didn't see, I was like, oh yeah, Oblivion. <laughs> 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 like the exact same thought process in my brain. Um, actually, it's from Death Stranding. Uh, it is not Death Stranding. We'll, we'll call this one because I actually know for a fact that none of you are probably familiar with it because this is actually from Deus Ex. Uh, this is oh. <laughs> this is the. Uh, I didn't realize they were. Uh, I. 
accidentally included both these in here in this episode. Uh, but there you have it. That's from Deus Ex. No one, uh, no one there. Um, let's take. Oh yeah, go ahead. I do just want to throw out that he did say Ex Machina, and Deus Ex is short for Ex Deus Ex Machina. Thank yeah. you. Wow. But he's talking about a completely different property. Favoritism. We don't know what was in DC's heart. Yeah. Oh my god. Knowing <laughs> Michael, twenty dollars paid up. <laughs> Please stop bribing our fact checker to try to sway <laughs> the game towards you. Uh, DC, and then Kelly close behind. Um, actually, Rocco's Modern Life? That is from Rocco's Modern Life. Again, not a piece of dystopic fiction, but it is a giant corporation that absolutely, uh, uh, that that sort of runs uh, everything uh, and is a thorn in Rocco's side. I would have been kicked <laughs> off the older millennial group text if I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> DC is first with Kelly close behind. Um, actually, someone mentioned it before, and it was Idiocracy. That is correct. This no! is the this is the big brand from Idiocracy, uh, Brondo. Uh, <laughs> thing. That will go to DC. Uh, that means DC, you got two. Eric and Kelly, you each got one. So this point will go to DC. Um, we're gonna get right back to our regular old questions here. Kubrick's adaptation of A Clockwork Orange takes many elements directly from the books, including Anglo-Russian slang called Nadsat, the Ludovico technique of behavior modification, and Alex's love of Beethoven. However, Kubrick did decide to change the ending by omitting the final chapter, in which Alex sees the error of his ways and becomes a productive member of society. Uh, Eric. So, um, actually, the name of the slang is not that. Uh, it is. It is Nadsat. I won't. I won't force you to remember what not I said. That. Nadsat is the uh, the name of the uh, okay. of the Anglo-Russian slang that. Um, actually, I actually did read the book a long time ago, mm -hmm. but I don't remember whether or not the Ludovico technique was included. So I'm going to guess that that was a. It was called that in the movie. Like that wasn't in the book. Is is my guess? No, that's not. That's not what we're looking for. Actually. Um. Actually. Uh. The. Mm, the. Book does not have the chapter where he uh, f finds the error of his ways. Uh, you sort of clumsily worded it, but you've kind of got what we're looking for here. Uh, so I, I'm inclined to give you the point. I think you've said what we're looking for. Um, here's here's what here's what the difference is. I claim that uh, Kubrick. Uh, uh, was the one who changed the ending by omitting the final chapter. Um, uh, but in fact, Kubrick didn't omit it. The American publishers did. So even in the book, um, there was a British version of A Clockwork Orange and an American version of A Clockwork Orange um, when it was brought over. And the uh, the American publishers were like, this ending is too like happy, too, too wrapped up too nicely. Americans won't go for this. You should just get rid of this final chapter and leave it on a somewhat dark, unsure note. Um, but the original version and the, the original British version has a final chapter where it's, it's just Alex being like, hey, yeah, I was kind of a shithead, wasn't I? Well, time to join society and clean up my act and, uh, I and think, dream of a better life. I think I knew that on some level, like, because I was like a huge edge lord when I was like fourteen, <laughs> so like that was that sounds like something that I would have like um actually someone about for sure. Like I would I would have been like, you know that not all stories are happy endings, <laughs> like and that actually American audiences like that. I like that your edge lord voice is a heavy smoker. Uh, Thank you. Uh, another little bit of um, uh, Clockwork Orange trivia in here: Malcolm McDowell's eyelids were actually being held open by antique lid locks in that scene. So that was an actual piece of of medical of like antiquated medical equipment and they, they actually had him with his eyelids actually pried open and he wound up slicing his cornea during filming <gasps> uh, uh from from the metal that was that was in there uh and that's also Stop. part of the reason why you have the, the the eyedroppers in there were actually from a medical professional that was like you it's like if you're gonna have him with his eyes open like he needs to have uh, he needs to have his eyes moisturized. So that's not an actor or a thing invented. That's an actual like medical person on set who is moisturizing his eyes with the, with that eyedropper. That's such a like Kubrickian thing to do to your actors. Uh, like, yeah, it's Torture like them. one of those things. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. one of those things where I'm like, or just I don't know, like be a better director. <laughs> like, yeah. you don't have to hurt yeah. someone. They're paying us to act, not to actually do this. Like, you don't actually yes. have to slice exactly. my cornea. But I do like imagining that when they filmed that scene in A Clockwork Orange, and then they were like, it's too late. We his eyes are wide open, and we got it. Close <laughs> for the and Stanley Kubrick was like, eyes wide. 
Sean? <laughs> He's like, hold on, hold on. Well, there's something here. Uh, well, that point will go to Kelly. Well, we'll move on to our next statement here. The movie Snowpiercer takes place on a train circumnavigating a frozen post-apocalyptic Earth, and that's not the weirdest part. The movie features a monologue about how babies taste, a gun-toting schoolteacher, and a scene where a group of axe-wielding guards gut a fish, a detail specifically included as an homage to director Bong Joon-ho's father, a fisherman. Uh, Kelly. Bong Joon-ho's father was not actually a fisherman. He just wanted to include that part, but uh, Weinstein told him that it would be too boring, and so he lied about it and was like, uh, yeah, my dad was a fisherman, so like it's really important to me to include this. Um, and that's how he got that scene in. No, Kelly, you did not say um actually. Oh uh, <laughs> she did say actually though. <laughs> One time actually, I actually okay. knew something. <laughs> oh my god. This happens all the time where someone will be like, I know that like they'll jump so I'm fast into it. <laughs> um, everything you said is a hundred percent correct. I would feel guilty stealing it because I didn't know that at all. <laughs> uh, everyone here looks like they're going to be gentlemen and not take your point. Uh, so, But I, I don't think I can award it to you because again, it's the one rule. It's the uh, one rule, it's the one rule. But you are, you're to everything you said is totally correct. Uh, there okay. was a long back and forth between Bong Joon-ho and uh, Weinstein about w whether or not this, this scene should be cut. And he finally just lied and said that uh, it's to honor my father who was a fisherman. And that was enough to get Fucking... the Rules. Keep it in the Listen, <laughs> no choice That's but so to stand. Great. I love that guy so much. You're talking about Bong Joon Ho, right? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be such a what a strange turn, right? If like all of a sudden you guys find out how Weinstein stand? Yeah, yeah. It's like now, now this is when you're <laughs> Bong Joon-ho found a way we out of a time. conversation with a Weinstein. Good for him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, this will bring us to our last shiny question of the game. This is a game that we call Needs More Pixels. What we've done is we've taken an iconic image from a TV or film, uh, from some sort of dystopic uh, uh, TV show or movie, um, and we have pixelated it all to hell. Chances are you're not gonna be able to tell what this fucking thing is. Um, but we have multiple levels of pixelation getting gradually clearer until we get to the original image. But you only get one shot to answer in this one. Let's take a look at that image uh, and tell me whether you think you want to use your one guess or if you would like to pass. I'm going to pass. Pass. Kelly and Eric are passing. They're all passing. Let's go one level clearer. Oh, I think, oh. No, I'm passing. <laughs> okay, Kelly's passing. I will take a stab at it. You're going to take a stab. Eric's going to take his guess. All right. Um, actually, this is the movie Oblivion. Uh, this is not uh, the the Tom Cruise movie that uh, we all thought we would see, but didn't actually get around to it, but it looked good and maybe sounded like it was kind of okay. No, it's not Oblivion. That takes Eric out of the running. DC, are you going to venture a guess or are you going to pass? I got to I gotta pass, Mike. Oh, oh, DC, you buzzed in. Um, Actually, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. This is from Brazil. That's correct. Yeah, That's what, what we're looking for. Um, nice. cool let's get a little bit clearer. Let's see what that should be. Yes, this is the the yeah. big baby face mask right in the foreground <laughs> in Brazil. Uh, okay. Very good job, DC. You, <laughs> do you guys want to know what I thought it was? Absolutely. Yes, please. <laughs> I thought it was ET. I thought, it was, like, I thought that was ET, and then like that platform was like a bicycle. <laughs> well, but I was like, that's not dystopian. Well, that point will go to DC. We only have one more question left in this game. Here's our last statement, which as always concerns real life skills. Uh, nothing to do with any of the dystopia stuff we've been talking about, just something that might be valuable for real life. So even though it's not worth any more points, in some ways it's maybe more valuable than any of, any of the other questions we've, we've talked about here today. Uh, here we go. Sure, you know about fictional disasters, but what about real ones? Your earthquake kit should include at minimum enough food for three weeks, one gallon of water per person per day, a whistle, pliers or a wrench, and moist towelettes. Uh, Eric. Um, actually, um, you need a blanket as well. There are other items, there are many other items that I didn't include in this list just because there wasn't room. A gun. <laughs> you guys, Eric loves his blanket. I know. I He's like, um, um actually I read in many different reputable <laughs> articles that you need at least two blankets. I also love that the next two items that like, gets like I need my blankie and I need my gun. These are the two things that will keep me safe. Um actually I'm going to say is it like 
two weeks of, of food instead of three weeks? Um, you found what's wrong, uh, at least. So uh, uh, it's it's the amount of the minimum amount of food uh, that is that is recommended. Uh, I said minimum of three weeks. That's incorrect. It's not two weeks. Um, uh, I'll give you the point unless someone can tell me what what it is. Um, actually, one week. Uh, no, that's not that's not what we're looking Shit. for. Um, three days. It's three days. Yeah, it's uh, oh. uh obvious, obviously. He didn't say I'm actually. But he didn't say I'm actually. <laughs> so you get you that. get nothing. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You get nothing. Good day, sir. <laughs> so we'll revert that point back to DC. So uh, uh yes, uh, certainly you can have more food than that, but the uh, recommended minimum is at least three days. Well, that was our last question, so that makes our final score, with DC getting that one, that is five for Eric, four for DC, one for Kelly. Of course, Kelly, you, you, we all knew you knew that other one, just we couldn't give you that point. It's okay. Uh, but that makes Eric uh, our winner for this episode. Congratulations. Um, I want to thank you all for playing with me, uh, imagining what the end of the world might look like with me for a little while in this the year of our lord 2020 uh, and thank you all for watching join us next time for even more pedantic corrections here on um actually